pawb, Rhodri Llwyd Morgan y Dwi, dwi'n gyfrwyddwr y Gymraeg a chysylltiadau allanol yma ym Rhif Ysgol a Brystwyth, wel, nid yma, ym Rhif Ysgol a Brystwyth, yma yn y swyddfa, yn y tŷ, yn felly mae wedi bod. Mae braf iawn bod yn rhan o'r digwyddiad uh, yma a, a fy mraint i yw i gyflwyno'r siaradwr. Um, mae'n bleser eich croesawu uh, hyn o i'r sgwrs am daith Thomas Charles Edwards i Ogledd America. Very, very warm welcome to everyone. My name is Rhodri Llwyd Morgan uh, and I'm here in my capacity as uh, Director of the Welsh Language and External Relations uh, at Aberystwyth University. And it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this webinar talk about Thomas Charles Edwards' journey to North America in 1890. Um, and this is an event uh, brought to you, it sounds quite televisual that, uh, this is an event which we're uh, putting on in partnership with the OSA, the Old Students Association, and we're very glad of that and grateful to the OSA for their support. The OSA, the OSA was formed um, to help the university with fundraising in 1892, uh, shortly after the trip that we're going to hear about uh, tonight. And, and it's uh, always uh, an organization that welcomes uh, involvement, participation, anybody that's interested in uh, life membership uh, as well. Um, and its aim is to help foster links with uh, former students um, and such as, my, as myself to keep in touch uh, with each other and with the university. You can find out details uh, about the OSA's activities at its website www.osaaber.org. Um, now to sit my hand in many ways for your question, Maud. Did need to make sure that my truck and tiny need him. On this goes my pal when he and Lau are zoom erbin him blue thin and all. I've never been clear with. I'm done of it. And now we're making a Freddy now. I can even get a shower, get a pobble, or bedwar ban bead. So with luck, this webinar uh, on Zoom um, isn't everything these days. Uh, it's going to be able to uh, speak to you um, across the globe. And, and I know we're, we're very happy that we've got participants uh, who are joining us today from uh, every part of the globe, including North America, um, which uh, we're going to be hearing a little bit more about in the same spirit uh, as Thomas Charles Edwards. You can get involved too. There are two ways uh, to participate. You can send in the question using the Q&A function, which is, should be, uh, at the bottom of your screen there. You can send in a question, um, write it in Welsh or in English uh, at any time during the talk. Um, or you could indicate uh, that you'd like to ask the question in person which would be quite exciting. So you don't want just be hearing from me uh, and Callista tonight. Um, and we'll do that after the, the talk, um, and we'll come to you uh, for your questions. Um, we're recording this as well. We won't be recording the, the Q&A session uh, at the end, um, and we'll be putting it out on the social media platforms as usual uh, after the event. So onto the talk. And, um, and I was asking Callista uh, about uh, the subject of the talk and, and as you know, it's focusing on, on that fundraising trip to North America in 1890 to raise money for renovation works following the devastating fire in 1885, which shut, did such damage to the building we now know as the old college. And I suppose it's, it's not a complete accident, unlike the fire, um, that, that we're looking at this history because we are at such an, interesting juncture in uh, the life of that project uh, that we're delivering now to renovate and repurpose uh, the old college. This very week, we've completed clearing the building after a lot of sweat, blood and tears, well, not much blood, uh, tears, certainly, and the company tasked with clearing asbestos from the old college is on site now. Hopefully, we'll be looking at builders on site uh, before the end of the summer and looking to cut the ribbon uh, on the renovated, repurposed old college uh, by the spring of 2023. So it's a, it's a really exciting uh, time um, and we're continuing to fundraise for it, of course, um, in order to make sure that we deliver exactly what the, the university, the students, the community 
uh, deserves. So that's that's where we're at at the moment. And I just want to say a very special thank you to so many of you who've already contributed and supported us. And, and thank you very much for that, as well as your support for other uh, university uh, causes, including student opportunities. It's such such a, a valuable contribution to our work. Thank you. But over to the speaker tonight, Dr. Callista Williams, uh, a brief word about her. So Callista completed an MA in History and Heritage at Aberystwyth in 2013, then a PhD with the Open University. Her PhD was part of an innovative collaboration with the National Library of Wales entitled The National Library of Wales and National Identity, 1870 to 1916. She now works for Lifelong Learning at Aberystwyth, where she's the Humanities and Science Coordinator and is making a, you know, brilliant job of that, if I might say so, and teaches history and genealogy as well. She's also a freelance researcher and a genealogist and has contributed to programmes on the BBC and S4C. I asked for a quirky fact and she gave me two. So Callista says she is fascinated by historical true crime and has spent lockdown investigating a case from 1920. She says no more about it than that. I don't know if it involves her, but she knows. Uh, and also she was delighted as the genealogist that she is to discover that one of her own ancestors from Snettisham, Norfolk, was convicted in the 1840s of maliciously damaging a Scotch fur and was imprisoned for a month. Uh, not a vandal, I don't think, but an early eco-warrior is the way I sort of read it, but anyway. <laughs> so that's enough from me for now. Uh, you'll see me again um, when Callista's talk is at an end and we, we do a bit of Q&A. Uh, so over to you, Callista. Thanks, Jill Rodri. Okay, I'm just going to start by sharing my PowerPoint. Right. Takes a little longer to get ready when you have lots of online things. Um, yes, Jochen Vau Rodri, thanks Rodri. Jochen Thor Henu, Iprin Haun de Mar, I I'm aware that lots of people are joining us um, across different time zones, um, Heno as well. So thank you for coming this evening, uh, this afternoon, and possibly this morning. And Kreiso uh, um, Bab, welcome everyone. Um, my talk today is going to focus on a trip made by Thomas Charles Edwards, the first principal of the University College in Aberystwyth, to America and Canada in the summer of 1890. This was in order to collect donations to fund the renovation of the college following the fire of 1885, and specifically the college library. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, just click to my next slide. So first of all, how I came across the funding trip, um, and then a potted history of the University College of Wales and the fire of 1885. I'm then going to present a profile of Thomas Charles Edwards, who was the driving force behind this trip and played such a key role. I then want to look at the expedition itself, the motivation behind it, the logistics, and focus on the key locations that Edwards visited. And then I'm going to look at the key outcomes. How did the college benefit, but also how did the library benefit? and ask whether the trip was a success. Also throughout, I want to consider two broader questions. Why did these individuals choose to give money to this particular cause? And in what ways is this funding trip linked to Welsh national identity in diaspora communities? And then at the end, there'll be a point where you can ask some questions. So how did I come across this particular funding drive? I came across this trip while researching for my PhD. So my thesis is a study of the establishment, management and utilization of the National Library of Wales between kind of circa 1840 and 1916. My work aims to situate the development of the National Library within a broader history of Wales during this period. My approach in my thesis was to connect the library to the cultural and political situation from which it emerged posing questions about the library's relationship to Welsh national identity. So even though the National Library wasn't founded until 1907, a de facto National Library or collection was housed by the University College Wales, following a commitment by the college at the Mould I Stedford in 1873, 
So that's a year before the college was founded. So I was interested in examining the influencing factors that led to this pre-National Library being created. Because one of the, my central research questions was why was the National Library founded in 1907 and not earlier? What circumstances were required for a National Library to thrive in Wales? Well, I came across Thomas Charles Edwards' fundraising trip while exploring the College Library's history in the University College of Wales archive. My interest was piqued because Edwards' trip to America was to raise funds specifically for the College Library rather than just for the general renovations of the college. So who was T.C. Edwards? So he was the son of Lewis Edwards, principal of the Bala Calvinistic Methodist College. And Thomas Charles Edwards attended Oxford in the 1860s and was ordained in 1864. He became a preacher in Liverpool where he was extremely popular, combining a religious zeal with a learned approach. Also, he continued to travel and preach throughout Wales. He became principal of Aberystwyth College at its founding in 1872, and then succeeded his father as principal at Bala College after returning from America. And he was also a keen bibliophile, so he was interested in the library, but also specific Welsh manuscript collections. So the hotel building on the seafront in Aberystwyth had been purchased in 1867 for the purpose of a college which opened in 1872. But in the summer of 1885, the college was devastated by fire. And you can see here in this image, the college actually um, on fire in 1885. So this resulted in the death of three people and destroyed a large section of the building. And the North Wales Express reported at the time that, quote, it was apparent that the northern wing, by far the largest portion of the building, was doomed, but the attention of the crowd had already been turned to saving the valuable books in the library. And it was due to the efforts of students and staff on the night of the fire that the library and half of the museum collection were saved. Um, I mean, completely against health and safety um, when we think about it from a modern perspective, but it was really the efforts on that night that saved so many of the valuable collections of the university. So before 1885, Aberystwyth College to a point had languished in obscurity, overtaken by the colleges of Cardiff and Bangor, who were legitimized by a full British government grant. Aberystwyth was granted annually 4,000 pounds in 1882, but this money was transferred to Bangor College following its founding in 1884. Cardiff College also received £4,000 when it was established in 1883, highlighting further the perception of Aberystwyth as a local college rather than a national institution. Supporters of Aberystwyth continued to lobby the government for a grant in line with the other colleges, but the government departmental committee would only permit the college to, be, to receive £2,500. So the fire placed the college already lurching from one financial crisis to another in a precarious position, and this could have marked the end of the college. But interestingly, instead it triggered a wave of support. Again, the North Wales Express reported that the fire has brought about an excited and earnest zeal for the college's welfare and its rights that perhaps could have no other way have been aroused. Another college should be erected and this time on the same footing as Bangor and Cardiff. Several newspapers in Wales and those circulated amongst the Welsh speakers of the United States printed Principal T.C. Edwards' letter to the Mayor of Aberystwyth, which contained the patriotic lines, the college has, it, has at length had its baptism of fire. It will arise from its ashes with a new life. Wales will never now let it die. Following the fire, Aberystwyth's government grant was increased to £4,000 in line with Bangor and Cardiff, which is strongly supported by Welsh MPs from both political parties. And the sudden surge of support following the fire has swiftly raised Aberystwyth's profile and emphasised its role in the history of Welsh higher education. And as the historian Kenneth O'Morgan argued, firmly impressing itself on the social and national consciousness of the Welsh people in a manner unique to the educational world. So the positive impact of the fire was evident at the time, with Archdeacon Griffiths declaring only three weeks after, quote, it is wonderful what the fire has done. It has destroyed the college, that gives us much grief, 
but it's also destroyed what has given me much gratification, a large amount of prejudice that existed in the minds of many against the college. So this outpouring of support ultimately benefited the college library, which would, following renovations, be housed in a purpose-built space with the protection of important Welsh manuscripts following the fire now firmly on the agenda. So there's a real kind of side benefit following the fire that these kind of valuable manuscripts were now seen as, you know, that they were unique and that something like a fire could destroy a huge collection in one night. So it really put them on the agenda. So after the fire, Edwards and others had been fundraising for the college in Wales and in the cities in England where there were Welsh populations. Edwards had been thinking about going to America since as early as 1888, as in February of that year, he sent a letter to the college secretary requesting, quote, will you kindly ask the treasurer in confidence what he would say to the proposal that he and I should visit the United States? I've received several letters from my friends in the States and they think we can get money for the college. So the development of, of purpose-built areas for the museum and the library after the fire altogether cost £3,300. These costings only included the construction of the library and not its fixtures and fittings. So it was for the cost of these materials that Edwards decided to collect for his tour of America and Canada during the summer of 1890. Edwards' explanation for focusing his campaign on the library was because he thought that quote, it would be better to consolidate our wants in a concrete form, and that it would appeal to the Welsh Americans to furnish the new library with complete fittings in a style equal to the very handsome equipments of the best American colleges. Also, the cost of the library's fixtures were estimated to be a thousand pounds or five thousand dollars at that stage, which was an achievable financial target for Edwards. Importantly, the library was also a space where an inscription could be placed on public display, to commemorate those who had given so generously. And Edwards explicitly told the American and Canadian donors about this planned inscription, um, which you can see here on the slide. Um, and I'll, I'll translate the, to the English. So this library was furnished by the patriotic Welshman of the United States and Canada, 1890, and then includes the proverb, hateful the man who loves not the country that nurtured him. So it seems that the primary aim of the trip in the minds of the college committee was actually so Edwards could have a change and a rest as he had been overworking, but he seems to have been a man who never stopped working as a principal or a preacher. Edwards reported on his return from North America that, quote, many opportunities were offered me to bring the claims of the college under the notice of Welshmen there who still treasure love for Ihen Ulad, the old country. Although he goes on to say, Quote, perhaps I ought not to have used the expression claims of the college. For the Welsh people in the States, they have not ceased to be Welsh, are yet in their inmost hearts and deliberate judgment Americans. Our college will not affect their interests in the slightest degree. Still, they gave me not only a patient, but a kind, I may say even an enthusiastic hearing. And it's this idea that it will, quote, will not affect their interests in the slightest degree, which poses the question, why did these individuals still choose to contribute financially? So as you can see here, I'm, I'm leaning on the work of um, Nielsen and Riddle who've studied diaspora homeland investment in the 21st century. But I think their model is useful here when thinking about um, T.C. Edwards' trip. So these donations can be described as acts of altruism or an unselfish act. But Nielsen and Riddle ask, is investment motivation actually more complex? Could donating help to increase a person's social recognition within their diaspora community and their homeland resulting in, quote, a, a group belongingness? Did they feel a socially constructed pressure or what's known as a homeland duty, which was reinforced via the homeland as in Edward's visit? Could it help to increase the diaspora's members' social embeddedness, such as the density and strength of their social network ties in both the country of residence and the homeland? Or could they be motivated by potential personal satisfaction known as the warm glow effect, which is seen to be intensified in a group scenario? So I'll talk now a bit more about the trip itself and then return to these points again in the final section. 
So Edwards and his wife arrived in New York in June 1890 on the SS Spain, which you can see here, um, and a reception was held in their honour by the St David Society, presided over by Judge Noah Davis. Edwards took no time in mentioning the great debt of the college, and many of the wealthy Welshmen in attendance immediately pledged donations publicly at the dinner, including Noah Davis, who pledged $900. So Ronald L. Lewis in his book, Welsh Americans, states that Welsh migrants arriving in America tended to join family and friends in established communities in urban industrial areas such as Scranton, wilkes Bar, and Pittsburgh. When Ed Edwards visited in 1890, there were just over 100,000 Welsh in America, mainly in the states of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin. The Calvinistic Methodist chapel culture was central to these communities. And the chapel was a place where Welsh migrants met regularly, which was ideal for Edward's fundraising as he was able to address large groups without having to organise specific events. The breadth of Edward's tour is evident from the college's report on the American contributions, which reveals donors located across America from New York to California. And I've created this map so you can see um, where the donors were based and the, the route that Edward's took. So this map shows the various places he visited and the distances he traveled. And in some areas, he was able to go to multiple chapels to collect donations. So you might have in the collections list a, a town or a city, and then it would list the chapels underneath that he's visited. So although Edwards raised, Altogether, Edwards raised approximately $4,530, of which three quarters came from the states of Pennsylvania, New York, and California, where the average donation was just under $12. In these areas, some gave substantial amounts, such as David Edwards from Plymouth, Pennsylvania, who gave $125. David Edwards was born in Glamorganshire in 1825 and was president of Kingston Coal and director of Wilkes Bar Hospital. Although other states gave less, such as Wisconsin, there was a high level of engagement with 227 people giving $205, so less than a dollar each. So really with this graph, I want to emphasize that yes, places like Pennsylvania gave a lot of money, but it's really interesting to see places like Wisconsin where a very large amount of people are just giving very small amounts. So Edward's reputation as a Welsh nonconformist minister preceded him, and he spent much of his trip visiting nonconformist chapels to preach in both Welsh and English. Money would then be collected for the library fund from the congregation. So as you can see here, in Wisconsin, Edwards attended a good number of the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist churches in the area of Wild Rose, so these documents also give a sense of how this information was recorded and that Edward was, Edwards was keen to collect the names of the donors so they could be printed and distributed at a later date. So these are the records I think that they were keeping as they were on their trip, making sure that they recorded as many names as possible. And then later on, I'll, I'll show you a slide of the, um, the printed booklet that was created. So after Edwards returned to Wales in January 1891, the Welsh American magazine, The Cambrian, published an article on Edwards, including a portrait, which you can see here, charting his various achievements at the college and as a minister. His trip to America is summarized in the closing paragraph, quote, his vigorous thinking, powerful delivery, and the fervency of his spirit made a deep impression on his hearers generally, and his preaching proved to be many a season of refreshing. And there, Edwards and his wife, visit to America will be cherished by many as one of their most pleasant recollections. However, the article is not uncritical, describing his style as not very fluent, nor his voice very melodious. But as we listen to him, we feel that there is a living man in the pulpit whose intellect has grappled with the great truths of revelation. And I think that was, is a really interesting um, part of Edward's personality that I think when he was there, he was extremely good at connecting with people. 
So the experience of attending sermons delivered by this eminent preacher from Wales likely provoked a sense of group belongingness, which I touched on earlier, within the diaspora community and also with the homeland represented by Edwards. It may also have reinforced a feeling of social embeddedness, reminding individuals of past chapel experiences, possibly back in Wales before immigration, and a connectivity through the use of the Welsh language. For Edwards, his ability to trigger these emotions and invoke the homeland duty effectively had the potential to increase donations for the college library. But how successful was the trip? Well, on his return, Edwards had collected $4,530, which was not too far off the $5,000 he had aimed for, and donations continued to be received once he was back in Aberystwyth. The trip itself cost £52, but Edwards returned the expense money, which was put towards the cost of expensive books for the library, which certainly demonstrates his commitment to the cause. Although the funds raised by Edwards were only for the fixtures and fittings, it sparked an interest in the books that, were later, that would later fill the library. And Edwards reported to the college governors that, quote, a suggestion was made to me in America that as soon as the work of furnishing the library with adequate fittings is completed, we should start a fund, the interest of which we placed every year at the disposal of the Senate for the purchase of such expensive books as they may consider necessary in what we hope will in time be one of the best libraries in Wales. And it was also decided that some of the more generous Americans to, would be appointed to the honorary court of governors, giving them social recognition in the homeland. Following Edward's return to Aberystwyth, his trip is reported in the November minutes of the court and council. Quote, the principal has been to America and many have generously given to the Welsh Library Fund. And I found that this was one of the first instances in the college minutes and reports that the library is described as the Welsh Library. And it may be that the use of the library as a marketing tool to extract donations from the Welsh diaspora had created a stronger connection, in the minds of the committee at least, uh, between the library and a concept of Welshness. And this obviously goes on to be part of the nucleus collection for the National Library of Wales. So that's why, from my point of view, I was particularly interested in it. So thinking back to the National Library, a section of my thesis is dedicated to a close analysis of the building fund subscriptions from 1905 uh, to 1910. And I found myself asking if T.C. Edwards had such a successful trip, why were there not more donations from North America in support of the National Library of Wales when the building fund was established just over 10 years later? because I've only been able to identify two donations from North America, one from Wisconsin and one from Montreal. So did the National Library of Wales campaign not have an equivalent dedicated fundraiser such as TC Edwards or the money and time for such a trip? The National Library of Wales campaign had some excellent fundraisers such as the magistrate Daniel Clifford Thomas from Swansea, who collected hundreds of small donations from the mining communities in South Wales but he wouldn't have been able to spend six months away from the campaign or his own work. I think Edwards was unique in the sense he was able to preach, giving something to the community before they gave something to the cause. And he was already a well-known figure before arriving in the States. He also had connections in North America before he went, who helped him organize his trip and importantly put him up. There's a reason why it only cost £52, that he'd spent a lot of time staying with other people. Principal Edwards' expedition raised a healthy amount of over £1,000 for the new college library, but this took him the whole summer to collect. Furthermore, in 1890, when Principal Edwards embarked on his trip, the number of Welsh immigrants in America was at its peak, estimated to be over 100,000. Over the preceding decades, numbers declined because rural Welsh residents moved to the South Wales coal fields for work rather than going abroad. Therefore, it may have been deemed more cost effective by the National Library of Wales Campaign Committee to dedicate fundraisers energies to collecting subscriptions in Wales and in areas of England where there were pockets of Welsh migrants rather than going any further afield. So, in conclusion, 
This fundraising expedition may only have been successful during this period when Welsh migrant levels were high and they were still first generation Welsh with first hand knowledge of Wales. They lived often with family and friends and continued to practice their religion and speak the Welsh language. Edwards represents a combination of the traditions of nonconformity with a new invigorated Wales advocating the new Welsh higher education system. And if we return to the concept of investment motivation, I think the construction of Edwards' campaign fits well into the conceptual model of motivation set out by Nielsen and Riddle. The public act of donating in the majority of cases as a chapel service, I think would have led to social recognition in the diaspora community, and then in the homeland where the plaque was erected and names of donors were published. And you can see here an example of what the, um, the printed booklet looked like. So this contains a lot of the same information from the written notes. Often there's a bit more information about the individuals and also um, there's a few more added because I think some people donated after Edward's trip, um, so donations are slightly increased. Um, yeah, but it's amazing how many people they, they did actually manage to record, which is a kind of wonderful uh, kind of social document and also interesting from a, a genealogist's point of view. So to go back then to Nielsen and Riddle and this concept of homeland duty, which I think was represented by the presence of Edwards, Maybe this duty would not have been as successfully evoked had any request letters been sent. Social embeddedness was key at this point as many first generation immigrants had lived in Wales and still very much subscribed to the Welsh culture in their diaspora communities. This may have faded over time as the immigrants and their children became more assimilated into American culture and there was a decline in chapel culture. The warm glow effect, again, in the majority of cases, potential donors were addressed by Edwards in their social groups, which may have intensified the warm glow compared to sending a donation privately. So after Edwards returned, um, so by the time the library opened, um, Edwards had actually left for um, the, the new role that he had at Bala, um, but he did return for the opening ceremony of the library. And it was a large event attended by 300 people, including Welsh bishops and the principals of all the Welsh colleges. Um, the rather, uh, we may think of as meat heavy luncheon, um, cost 50 pounds, um, which ironically is the same amount as it cost Edwards for his whole six month trip around America. Um, and at the opening, uh, Lord Aberdare said that the gift by the Welshman from America was a mark of sympathy with the personal influence of Principal Edwards and an indication of American generosity towards the cause of education. That room and its gifts from America showed that blood was much thicker than water. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.